I am Christine John. I am 33 years old. I am a British-born Sierra Leonean. I work as a social impact and sustainability manager for a global law firm. And prior to that, I worked in the charity sector, working with young people in the social mobility space. So, Christine, on your social media, you make reference to uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Is that correct? I do. So, explain to us why that scripture is so important to you. So, Philippians 4, 13 is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Um, I really like that scripture because it's just a reminder to me, you know, anything yeah. that is going on in life, particularly at work, working in quite a, you know, high stress in, in the corporate sector, mm. when I feel like I can't do something, if I think about that, I'm normally able to get over that hurdle yeah. and, you know, go ahead and, and achieve what I need to achieve. Yeah. It's kind of nothing really, I know it sounds a bit cliche, but if you put your mind to something, you really, most times you can achieve it. So I just okay. try and meditate on that when things, you know, seem a bit shaky, a bit tough, that, yeah. you know, I can do all things. Okay, nice. And you've got quite a mouthful of a role. So you are a social impact and sustainability manager. Yes. So describe to us what that role involves. So it's probably most people might know it as a CSR or corporate responsibility. Okay. Um, for most big companies, it is how you as a business are being responsible um, mm. to the communities around you, to your people um, that you employ, right. to uh, your clients. And so I work on things like fundraising, volunteering. Yeah. Um, I work for a law firm, so pro bono is quite a big thing that we do. And sustainability in you know, climate change is you know, really important to everyone across yeah. the world. So we're looking at how we can bring our carbon footprint down. Um, you know, businesses are looking at how they can bring their carbon footprint right. down and do their, their, their part to okay. you know, stop the climate crisis. So I work across all those things. Oh, and volunteering, so employee engagement is a big yeah. thing as well in my role. In the fashion industry, I guess sustainability really came to prominence, I'd say about five years ago. And I had a personal experience with it where I knew that I had to implement it within our business to, I guess, uh, not only address a PR kind of message, but also uh, an internal message because it's a better way to do business. Mm -hmm. But would you say that certain business are just kind of ticking boxes with the sustainability and not doing it properly? Yes and no. Um, there is a lot of talk about companies greenwashing, right, you know, yeah. doing, yes, doing things just to tick boxes. I mm. think I think it's really easy to see when something is greenwashing and when, when it's okay. genuine. Okay. Um, there is an element in the corporate space where you have to do it because every other, every other company is doing it. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I would say I would call that greenwashing. I would say it is going with the times. Okay. Uh, you know, the t the world is changing, times are changing, and it's important that businesses are able to react to these things that are happening. I think your customers or your clients will know when you're greenwashing right. or when you're genuinely doing this. And, you know, working in this role, you know, I personally know that the reasons why I got into this is because mm. it's something I really believe in. I believe it's something that companies should be should be dedicating time and resource to yeah. solving, whether within their business or with their client's business. Okay. Um, so as, a, as an individual working in that space, I can say that, you know, I do it for the right reasons yeah. and okay. it will always come to light if you're not doing it for the right reasons. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's start from the beginning in terms of who Christine is. Describe to us what Christine, what Christine was like as a child and how you are as a woman and what the similarities are between your personalities? When I was a child, I would say I was a very timid okay. child, always reading. Right. <laughs> my uh, family, particularly, you know, a cousin, that my really close cousin, say I was, I was always reading. My yeah. head was always in a book. <laughs> I was definitely into education, you know, always wanted to get good grades. Um, and, you know, in my family, I think that was expected of me uh, not to say it wasn't expected of you know the rest of my siblings but definitely I was you know quite into my education and you know having African parents that yeah. was really 
a focus. <laughs> I remember my dad used to make us um, at the summer holidays. We had to write essays at the end of the summer holidays <laughs> about, you know, what did you do over the summer? And, you know, all our friends are outside playing you know, or we're writing essays, reading the first aid in English and stuff like that. Um, so I'd say that's what I did as, you know, very... I was really skinny as a child, which I think um, there was a lot of insecurities that came from that. But at the same time, I had, you know, a, a close group of friends in right. school. So I was I was able to be myself um, around them. Okay. As I've gotten older, um, I think I'm less timid. Most people would say I am I'm probably not timid anymore. Mm. Quite confident, outwardly confident, maybe not so much inside, but, you know, I don't <laughs> display that um, at work or anything. Yeah, so I think I think that confidence has grown maybe because I've put on a bit of weight since then, um, and you know just you know been, become more comfortable in myself yeah. um, as I've grown older. You just touched upon a topic where you said you're not that confident at work as you might be outside. Is there a particular reason for that? So at work, I think people would say I am confident, right, but I, I think I mean internally, right? I'm probably breaking down, but I don't show that okay. at work. Okay. And we spoke off camera, you mentioned that you um, have a Marfan syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, can you elaborate a bit on what that is? Yes, so uh, Marfan syndrome is a genetic condition. Um, a number of people in my family have it. Uh, my dad uh, being the person who I found out had it. And then okay. everyone in our family got tested for that gene. Um, and I had the gene. And so I was tested regularly since I was, I'd say since I was sort of in college age yeah, okay. 16 17 tested regularly and essentially one of the um symptoms is your aorta which is the biggest valve in your heart starts mm. to expand okay. and you can then have what they call an aortic dissection which means it will tear uh, so i was you know I took tablets for a long time mm. and over one summer my my aorta was growing rapidly and they kind of gave me the decision to have a preventative surgery uh, so i have you can see my scar I had a valve sparing aortic root replacement in 2014. So that means my aortic root is now made out of plastic. Okay. Um, so, right, right. But there's a lot of other symptoms that come with it. Yeah. Uh, but the heart part was the main thing for me. Okay. So it's not uh, something that's specific to uh, ethnic minorities, it's just... No, okay. no. But it's quite rare. Uh, I don't quite know the statistics, but I'm mm. sure we can Google it. Um, the amount of people who have it, okay. to people who have it tend to be abnormally tall. I'm actually right. not that tall, but actually my uh, siblings, my dad, all, yeah. you know, really tall, uh, tend to have quite long limbs, um, long fingers, that okay. sort of thing. So there are some things that, that are characteristic of having Marfan syndrome, right. but we only found out because uh, some members of my family, my dad, my uncle, had aortic dissections um, and ended up having sort of emergency surgery wow. and then they picked it up for the rest of us. Um, so. Wow, okay. So, so, so going back to what you said previously about confidence, mm -hmm. where would you say that you get your confidence from? Funnily, I think a lot of my family will say that it came after I had that surgery. Okay. I remember when I had it and I, I used to wear... Um, what do you call them? Turtle decks. <laughs> Up to here. Uh, so if you wouldn't see the scar. Mm. And then just, you know, one day I, I wanted to wear something. And I was like, well, yeah. like, what am I supposed to do about yeah. this? So actually now I actually consciously wear a lot of things that are, you know, a little bit more low cut, right. V-neck that yeah. show it. And, you know, sometimes I'm on the train. People ask me questions. Um, actually went out for drinks after work. And one of my colleagues was like, you know, tell me about this. Mm. And, and I just think it's, it has just helped me. I remember when I woke up after the surgery, the pain that I was in, because, right. you know, they essentially split your rib cage in half and they mm. do all they got to do and that, and the recovery process and that, you know, people go in and have surgery and they, they die on the table, mm. you know, when the doctors come around and they tell you to sign and yeah. they give you all the statistics. And, you know, I, I could have, you know, similarly, um, my dad, when he had his iotic dissection, maybe, could, you know, so I think that has really made me realise, you know, life is really short. Sure. Um, I am going to try and enjoy my life as much as I possibly can mm. because, you know, I have this syndrome. It's, as I said, it's genetic. If I was to ever have children, they might have it. But, yeah. you know, you just have to 
it's, it's nothing. I can't do anything about it, basically. Yeah. So yeah. I might as well try and overcome it. So mm. I think that has had a lot, a positive boost uh, to my confidence, definitely. Um, I'm definitely way more outgoing <laughs> since I had that. And, you know, that might even been, you know, one of the symptoms of it is just, you know, extreme exhaustion and tiredness, okay. which I had loads of before. I still do have that now, but it's not as bad and I can feel the difference that it's made to yeah. me by having that surgery. I mean, um, you know, when you did your degree, was there kind of, did it have any effects on you then? Because I guess doing a degree is quite a stressful time and you had quite a stressful job as well. So were there any kind of symptoms that you had while studying? While studying, um, just the tiredness. Oh. <laughs> I was definitely always tired. Uh, so I've got two degrees. I've got my, my um, BSc that I did way back when and I've got an MA. I think yeah. I felt it more when I was doing my MA because yeah. I was working at the same time. Okay. But and that was actually after the surgery of the MA, but I think that was just me putting stress on my body, to sure. be honest. Sure. Um, but during uni... Not so much. Um, if anything, I, I suffer from uh, endometriosis as well. That was probably okay. what affected me more when I was at uni than, mm. than my heart. Um, but at that point, I was still, you know, just taking the tablets and that. And it wasn't until I got into my working life that I had the surgery. So right. I, did, I didn't know, probably, <laughs> as much as how it was affecting me back then. I was just sort of going with it. And uh, what's your, your MA? Uh, the Sociology of Childhood and Children's Rights. Oh, wow. So does that relate to the job you have now? No. <laughs> I guess, you know, I do work with young people um, still um, yeah. in my role. Okay. From You know, we bring young people into our company right. to, you know, sort of wide, widening um, participation, okay. raising aspirations, that sort of thing. But no, my degree, my MA, I did my MA because it was something that I wanted to do. Okay. Whereas when I went to uni the first time, really it was just because you go to uni yeah. as an African child <laughs> it wasn't really you know I remember I didn't um I never visited my uni before I went there like yeah. the day I rocked up to Kent was the day I, I went to Kent you know I just googled I, I knew I wanted to study law and psychology okay. that well they were they were the two subjects I got the highest grades in A level mm. and I was like fine I'll just study that and there was only a couple of unis that did it and so that's how I ended up at Kent but it wasn't really a conscious decision whereas the MA was you know, some time had passed, I'd been working, I was like, I want to do a master's. <laughs> and so I applied and I got in and I, I just did it, um, you know, part-time as I was working. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was the reason. But it, it doesn't really have influence on my work. Okay. Um, it was genuinely something I was really interested in. I did my dissertation on black British girls and that sort of girlhood. Again, just something I had a real interest in. Mm -hmm. I keep saying to people, one day I might do a PhD and, you know, do more on that, but that would be much later okay. in life. And on that topic, topic, actually, what would you advise to your younger self if you, you know, had a chance to sit down with her? Most of the things that you think matter mm. don't matter. <laughs> That's what I would say. You know, when you're a young girl, like everything seems to be so big, so important, you know, whether it's how you look or how you're being perceived by other people, mm. you know, do my teachers like me? Do my friends like me? Does this boy like me? All this, right. it doesn't matter mm. because ultimately life is, life goes on, mm. you know, you, you were a child for, or well, you're a child for quite a long time actually, but you know, now I'm an adult, I just, forget about everything that really happened when I was a kid obviously it shaped me but a lot of the stuff that I was worried about back then means nothing to me right. now right. yeah now the thing is I have an older sister who is um who's dark skinned so growing up I was able to see just some of the maybe challenges I think she faced because she was attributed to her dark skinness would you kind of agree in terms of the experience you've had growing up because naturally, naturally you're dark skin yourself it's mm, a good question this is the first time i've ever probably actually had to think about that as mm. a question okay. um i i would say so i got really made fun of at school because i was really skinny right. um i don't recall ever being picked on because i was dark skin there were quite right. a few dark skin girls at our school yeah, I don't, I don't really, I don't think that, I've, I've never consciously okay. thought about that, but I do see how um, 
standards of beauty are right. different um, for dark skinned girls versus, you know, people who are not dark skinned. I think I have some friends who they would say that they definitely have, you know, either face certain things like colorism has been a real thing in their life. I think everyone, we have such varying shades in my family. <laughs> if I stand next to my mum and even my brother, like we are completely different shades. And I do get people saying, are you sure you're related? You know, that sort of thing. And my brother will joke and say I'm adopted, that kind of thing. So in that sense, I, I've had I've had jokes here and there, yeah. but I don't think that's, that wasn't the thing I was preoccupied with when I was mm. younger. It was because I was skinny. <laughs> that was not good. <laughs> so uh, next, I just wanted to ask you about your heritage. Because that's something that we, we have in common. So do you want to tell the viewers where you're from? I am from Sierra Leone, which is in West Africa, a really small country. Um, most people know Ghana, Nigeria. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we are, you know, quite small but mighty. Um, I am, my parents are Creo, uh, so we are a very tiny population, actually, yeah. of um, Sierra Leone. We tend to have names like so my name is Christine John there's Johnson's there's Smith's that sort of thing um and that's just you know all based on you know slavery yeah. um Freetown is where you know the freed slaves essentially landed at a certain point and one of my friends is going to be so annoyed because I'm not I'm not telling I'm not telling it how it should be told um but you know there's a very very long history there um of our you know generations and generations yeah. of abuse and, and slavery as to um, what makes queer people, I think, you know, really, really special. Yeah. I think queer people are also a dying generation, I would say. You know, a lot of people in, in our generation are, you know, marrying non Sierra Leoneans and non queer people. So it's quite hard to see how that culture will be passed down. Yeah. It's it's not necessarily the most dominant um, culture. And I would say, you know, my grandma, bless us, you know, in her 90s. And I was like, I need to learn how to cook this before she, she leaves this earth. Or So, you know, I'll have something to to pass down if I was yeah. to ever have children. Um, but no, it's a very, very lovely country. And yeah. I hope I get to go back very soon. It is. It is. There, there's a programme on BBC with Roma Shrang and Nathan. Where you went to see that? Did you see that? I haven't seen it, but I have heard of it. Yeah, very good, very funny. So, uh, so when was the last time you went back to Syria? It's been a long time. Okay. I was I just finished uni, so maybe coming up to nine, ten years ago. Can, can you describe what your experience of Solo and Freetown was like? It was an experience. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it was, but it was fun. Yeah. Um, when I went, so I went with my mum and my dad, and my dad hadn't been back for years right. probably since after I was uh just around when I was born and so it was like you know really emotional him yeah. going back to his family house it was nice to go see where they grew up and it's like where my mum grew up she's from a village called Hastings um it was just it was just an interesting cultural experience for me I think um I, I wish I had gone when I was younger right. when you're younger you're more likely to kind of roll with with what's happening mm. whereas when you're older you know I've been through uni and you know the light why are the lights off I don't understand why there's no electricity <laughs> um, but you know you see you go with uh, younger kids and they're just like oh this is fun it's dark but um I think now I'd love to go back now because and I've been to you know other African countries since it's just mm. it's really beautiful yeah. the people are so happy yeah. um regardless of the circumstances they are living in they're you know really happy really positive they are really welcoming people I think uh Sarah Lunas in general are very welcoming very love enjoyment <laughs> it's really fun and we went at Christmas time so it was just it was just great great experience loved it yeah I concur because I went just after the civil war finished mm. and naturally that's such a time of turmoil and there's a lot of recovery and one thing that struck me is that everyone is just so welcoming and just so happy, more happy than we are over Absolutely. here. Absolutely. And I guess we seem to have more material things over here. Mm. Uh, so that was that was really admirable. Um, can can you can you speak the languages? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you can understand. I, I can understand yeah. it very well. I I try, yeah. um, but yeah, not as. No one near as good yeah. as some people. Yeah. Yeah, in our household, my mum and dad always spoke to us, mm -hmm. and then we always responded back in English. Yeah, 
And exactly. I've never really just kind of just gone to it like fully and, and, and spoken. I probably could do within about two weeks of doing it continuously, but I think just the shyness. Yeah. And the embarrassment that you get, get it wrong. Absolutely. And, yeah. Absolutely. But you know, I've got one of my cousins, he speaks it very well. Yeah. And we, we, we speak, we tell jokes and yeah. stuff. We obviously listen to serenaded music. Yeah, it's a funny language. And it's a very, yeah, honestly. <laughs> and so we, I, I do try, and I think that's even more reason it'd be great to go back because mm. I would love to get really. I don't know if I'd ever be fluent, yeah. but I would love to, you know, be able to just, you know, watch rolls off your tongue. Yeah, that would yeah, be amazing. Yeah. Uh, and what's your favourite dish? Oh my goodness, so many, so many. Um, I like cassava leaves. I like okra stew, or the way my mum makes it. Mm. I really like it. I like palm oil stew. Okay. Jollof rice, obviously. Mm. Cook the serenade away with basmati rice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> lots. It's just, it, you know, the food is lovely. It's very, um, it tastes different actually when you, you eat it over there because, mm. you know, the ingredients that we right. get here aren't necessarily the same. They've obviously been imported yeah. from, you know, lots of different places. But yeah, my mum, now I don't live at home anymore, but anytime I go back home, I go to my house, my mum's always like, I made this for you. Yeah. So I'm like, thank you. <laughs> but she's so happy. And, you know, sometimes me and my cousin will drive to um, South London. There's a couple of uh, ceremonial restaurants yeah. there where it tastes, you know, really authentic. Mm. So, cool. but I'd say cassava leaves is the top one. Okay. Mm. Now, going back to your career for a sec, what would the t- what does the term making it look like? according to Christine, because it means so many things to different people. How would you describe it? If we're talking about work, I certainly haven't made it um, at work. I had a conversation about with someone about this and, you know, they framed it as it's a state of mind. Okay. And I think that's, that's, that's spot on. I yeah. think a lot of us haven't made it. You know, yeah. a lot of us haven't made it, but that's because we don't perceive where we're at to mm. be us making it. Okay. And I think... Why I say I haven't made it at work, you know, a manager, there's, I could be a senior manager, I could be a head mm. of, I could be a director. There's so right. many places that you could go with my, my career, um, with my role rather. Equally in my, in, you know, my personal life, I'm in the process of looking to buy a house, you mm. know, I haven't, haven't done that yet. And so I personally won't feel like I've made it until right. I've achieved those things. Okay. Um, but I think yeah. it's, it's your state of mind. It's what you think. When you feel content, yeah. I would say, is when you can comfortably say you've made it. And it isn't, it isn't about money or mm. anything. It's not even necessarily about success. It's when yeah. you feel you've got to that point where you are content in your life, sure. in your circumstances. You know, you've got the right people around you, the right friends, you know, your family, everyone around you has yeah. equally made it. They feel content. I think, you know, if I, if I, for instance, I've made it, made it. And, you know, my brother was still struggling or mm. my sister was still struggling, then none of us have really made it. Okay. It's, it's a, about all of us going together. Yeah, I understand. Uh, and thing about your kind of come up to your to where you are now, was there anybody, whether in the limelight or family, that you looked at and you kind of thought, I, I want to be like you when I'm, when I'm, when I'm at that stage? I don't know in the limelight. Um, I, for instance, my role now, I didn't even know this it existed until, you know, maybe five years ago. Um, and just even even my firm had never heard of it until I started working there. So I wouldn't say I had that kind of uh, role model or inspiration. So, you know, there's so many people, so many of my friends and my family that are inspirational. Yeah. Um, you know, my parents obviously came over here and, you know, made a life for themselves. My younger brother is in, you know, the property industry. He's just making such big moves. It's definitely inspirational. I've got a cousin in the fashion industry who, you know, making big moves. I've got a friend that owns a restaurant. I've got a friend, that lives, another friend that works for a law firm. Just everyone is, is you know, just making moves. Yeah. Um, and so there's, a, there's an element of comparison there. You know, you look at, you know, your, your family and your friends and people are doing things and it can only inspire you to to do more yeah. and um as i said at the beginning my parents were very much you need to read your books you yeah. need to go to school <laughs> you need to be better than everyone else you need to do you know what i mean so i've always had that as a some people see that as a negative thing i don't mm. i didn't necessarily see it as a negative but it did it did push me to try and uh, do better and even when i'm working now mm. i think people i work with my colleagues would say that i 
I like to do things properly. I like to do things well. I like to see things through. Yeah. And that, I hope, inspires, you know, other people. Um, right. I manage to to amazing women who are, you know, younger than me. And I, I like to to model that in my yeah. behavior, that kind of ins- inspirational, you know, we're all here to, to do a job, yes. Yeah. And, you know, we're technically making money for someone else. But, you know, we should do what we do and we should do it well. And we should really, you know, put our effort, put our heart and soul into what we're doing and, and have a good outcome. And I, and I see everyone around me, all of my friends and family, that's that's just how they live their life. Yeah, yeah. It's funny because when you mentioned um, your brother, your cousin and all these people around you that are doing great things, they're also say learning, right? My family, yeah. All my family, yeah. Some of my friends are different, so, but yeah. I, I've, I've got this kind of way of thinking is that if... A couple hundred of us went back to Sierra Leone and spent five to ten years there to really kind of grow the country and, and the industry. Mm. But I, I guess it just take maybe ten to start the, um, mm. the, the kind of movement. Mm. Uh, so, thinking about uh, COVID, how was that for you? Did it did it really affect your industry? Did it affect kind of you personally? Was it a positive? I think COVID had its, <laughs> its journey ups and downs, ups and downs. Mm. Um, I thought at the beginning, because I live in a, in a house share, um, there's lots of, I live with my brother, but we live with other people. We felt it was so fun. Mm-hmm. Like just, you know, working from home and just being able to get to know them more. And, you know, we would watch TV together and, you know, we found it fun. Yeah. I'd say for the first three months. And then after that, I started to really, I, I want to go back to work. <laughs> I want to be in that not even necessarily the office environment. I just didn't want to be at home. And so I started to just, yeah, I would, I would just stay in my room quite a lot. I just wanted to, to withdraw and obviously I'd do my work and I'd, and, you know, continue. And just, mm. I just feel like we were all going through the, the motions yeah. during COVID because, you know, no one was ever sure what was happening. Mm. And, and then I got COVID, um, which I remember when I came out of isolation, I, was like, I hate, I hate, I hate where I'm living. I want to change everything. And I bought a chest of drawers and I changed everything in my room. And it's just, just being confined in that space really got to me when I got COVID. And then at work, I think it helped me, it helped me because, you know, working in the industry I work in, there was a lot of people who were suffering as, as a firm. We were able to help a lot of people during that whether it was, you know, donating laptops to, to young people who didn't have that um, resource to be able to continue at school, whether it was donating money to charity, small charities. So we were, I felt like we were able to make a real impact in that space. So I think it, that just, COVID was a positive for my role, but obviously not a positive for all the people that yeah, um, no, sure, needed sure. the support. Mm. Were there any kind of lessons you felt that you would learn or... No, let me rephrase it. Were there any things in your life that you've changed as, as a result of going through that period of lockdowns? I think, as I was saying, even you know, after my surgery, I became more outgoing. I think okay. I'm probably even more outgoing now. Well, you had um, surgery during, during lockdown? I had, I had a couple of surgeries during lockdown, actually, okay. uh, for my endometriosis. Um, but just in general, when you go into hospital, when you have mm. that moment of, oh, my goodness, like... I might not come out. Yeah. <laughs> I think every time I've, I've had five surgeries and every time I've had one, I'm just like, it just gets me to to start doing, you know, mm. more wild, crazy things. Like I'm always the one that's like, I'm going to go on holiday tomorrow, next week, because why not? Um, so I'd say all, all it has done is just made me more outgoing, okay. I think. Right. Yeah. Right. And this thing of your kind of lifetime, your lifespan, what's been the most inspirational thing you feel you've been in, involved in? having a surgery <laughs> which is it sounds a bit awful to say it but I, I think that it was just it was almost just the thing I needed right. to do better okay. be more of a go-getter mm. um in life okay do, do you do you have like a side hustle because <laughs> <laughs> you used to do blogging right I used to do blogging a very very long time ago mm. yes when yeah, I had, you know, I've got some friends who we were still very close and we used to do blogging. But it was never something that I think I ever really wanted to take seriously. Even now on my Instagram, I still do, you know, I take pictures and that sort of thing. But I don't think I would want to get into that as a as a side hustle. But I do I do appreciate the kind of creative, um, the creative aspect behind it. Um, I, I appreciate, you know, the kind of influencer 
um, generation yeah. and using social media to kind of, you know, at, social media being a career actually yeah. for some people. I really appreciate that. I love watching, you know, people's content. Mm. But yeah, I don't, I don't think it was, it's, I would ever have said it was a side hustle. It was just okay. something fun. Yeah, okay. I enjoyed doing. So, so, you, so you have a side hustle now? No, not, not, not a true side hustle, no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what, what can kind of people expect to see from Christine in the future? I just want to be able to exude positivity okay. to the people around me at work. I want to, you know, do more in my role for the, you know, in terms of how we can help people impact communities. I want to particularly even on like my social media I'd love to showcase more of like what my friends and my family did I said a lot of them making such big moves I'm always like you know so excited by anything they've got going on yeah just more more vibes more positivity <laughs> more life cool cool well um we're just gonna wrap up the interview just by just finding like a quick fire a b type questions okay so we'll start off with uh coming to america one or coming to america two come to america one Okay, no one's no one said come to America too yet. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Beyonce or Whitney? Oh wow! My cousin's gonna kill me. Beyonce. <laughs> okay. Uh, are you iPhone or Android? iPhone. Uh, how about a lifetime lifetime supply of hair hair products or lifetime supply of makeup? Makeup. Right. Uh, R and B or Afrobeats? Afrobeats. Okay. Uh, a well-paid job, but it's a really toxic environment, or a low-paid job and it you know, kind of feels great every day? Well-paid, but toxic. Okay. Because I would bring the positivity right. to the toxic environment. <laughs> uh, how, how about uh, fish and chips or jollof rice and stew? Jollof rice and stew. Mm-hmm. Uh, apprentice or, or dragon's den? Apprentice. Uh, Paris or Maldives? Paris. Right. And final one, heels or trainers? Heels. Right. <laughs> well, Christine, thank you very much for your time. It's been really kind of inspirational to hear your story. Uh, we'll include all of your kind of social media links in the description below. Thank you. Thanks for having me.